Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Eleanor and I spoke with the poet Ruth Padell. Ruth spoke about what it was to teach poetry at King's and the importance of the technical and form. She also spoke about uh, her views on the the up-and-coming Instagram poet generation, uh, as well as the newly elected poet laureate. It's a really great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Ruth, to our podcast, Always Take Notes. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So I think you're our first poet on Always Take Notes. So we wanted to start by talking about what what being a poet involves, particularly in 2019. How would you define yourself and your work? Well, poetry at the moment is in a state of variousness that I don't think it's ever been in. It's, it's very, very interesting. Um, Things keep coming back, the very formal and then the very, you know, the sort of 60s iconoclastic um, no holds barred. Um, And so what being a poet involves now is very, very different from what it was, say, even 15 years ago. Um, Now there's a lot more live audiences. There's um, a lot of interest in the self, the performing self within the poem. and I started when I when I started. I was a classical scholar. I was at Oxford. I was doing Greek. I um, I was investigating the the idea of the self in in ancient Greek mind. And gradually, I realised while I was teaching and so on that I, you know I, I wanted to write poetry. So I gave up my job and um, supported myself by reviewing. So in in those days when I started, um, being a poet meant something that it's always meant, you know, being totally alive. You never switch off, or you very rarely switch off to how you could make a poem out of that, how I could make a poem about how you're holding the microphone or or, or the light coming in through the window, anything, um, and where you go from there. So that's part of, you know, always being a poet, and all poets are always doing that. But the ways you do it, the way you put it onto the onto the page or on the screen, the way you give it to other people keeps changing. And that's one of the sort of glories of, of what's happening now, really. There's a lot of different sorts of poetry. Um, there's a lot of uh, young poets coming up. There's a lot of um, a lot of firms who are thinking that they can use poets in different ways. You see poems, bits of poems written up for, you know, opening a new railway station or something like that, or a... Or, um, a business, they have a poet in residence. Could we um, roll back a bit to the kind of start of your career? So, you, you know, you were an academic there. When you, were, when you were a young person, were you considering that you wanted to be a writer or did you, was academia specifically the, the avenue you wanted to go? I sort of fell into academia. Um, I sort of wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know, I, was, I suppose I was quite shy and I didn't know, I just read a lot. Um, I did Greek. My father taught me Greek. He was, um, you know, he was a schoolmaster from um, in the north, really, and then came down here and um, became a doctor and a psychoanalyst. But he taught me Greek, and he'd done Greek, and I sort of it was natural to do Greek. And then there was a professor there who said, "Well, I think you better work on tragedy, and you better do it with me." And and so I fell into it. And it was in those days, it was not nearly such a big thing. You, you know, you, you, I got a bit of a scholarship from Oxford. To, travel around Europe and research in Europe and um, I didn't I didn't sort of have a plan these days you have to have a plan because life is so hard um, and but I just found the poetry taking over so I did you know I finished the PhD and I got jobs teaching Greek and um, I turned the thesis into a couple of books um, but I was also by then publishing poems and you've spoken before about how your entry to poetry was actually through music. Um, your great great grandfather was a concert pianist, is that right? And um, you had a very musical family, and you found kind of music was the natural gateway into poetry. Can you tell us a little bit about how that move happened and what your earliest earliest memories of poetry are as a child? Yeah, so my earliest pe- earliest memories of poetry as a child are really the um, I had a wonderful book called the book of a thousand poems and i was very fond of animals so I, I i somehow found that i'd learned all the animal poems by heart and i loved the poems in the rudyard kipling jungle book and things and i found i knew those by heart too and it was a sort of it was a natural thing so i did s- try writing poems when i was little um and i did you know i did write some my mother swore she had a poem i wrote when i was three but i don't believe <laughs> um and um but i always loved singing as well 
And I learned the piano quite young for a while. And I had a really wonderful um, Jamaican piano teacher called Olive Lewin. This in Jamaica, this her name is sort of sacred. She she was then the only black pianist, the only black musician in I think the Royal Academy. And she was learning, she was le- studying there and she was teaching. And my father came across her. And she was, I was, you know, I didn't pro- properly practice. So she bribed me to practice by saying that she would accompany me on singing afterwards. And so I had this you know, beaten up little book called the Penguin Songbook. And I learned all these songs for her to sing. I learned a hundred songs. And so I think it was through singing that it was particularly um, how I, how I, that was added to the poetry as it were. Um, and that stayed with me. I always sing wherever I am, you know, try and um, join a choir or group or something like that. And do you sing any of your poems or any other poems? I don't sing them, but I, I enjoy saying them. And I think it is a musical thing. You, you know, Beckett was, was a musician. He was a very good musician. And his son is, is a flute player in a modern orchestra in London. And he his, his spaces, his beats, his cadences are those of a musician. And I think all good poets are also good readers. They have sort of musical sense of when you pause. Um, you know, how you crescendo, how you how you change the pacing and so on. So a lot of writers we've had on the show have said that, you know, they used to write poetry or they wrote poetry when they were young or this was something they did as teenagers. Um, why did you keep going? You know, a lot of people seem to write poetry at one stage and then move to another form. What, what was your, were you just possessed by it as a form of writing? I think you're, Yes, you're possessed by it as a, as a natural form of writing. And also you keep reading. A lot of people think they can write poems without actually reading what's being written now, you know. And when I teach on, for instance, a Narvan course or judge a competition, it is sort of quite extraordinary that people think, well, they, you know, they, they can write poems, but they don't need to read what other people's poems. I mean, if you, you know, if you were a baker, you wouldn't ever not eat the bread that other bakers have made you you want new ideas you want oh that's a good that's a good standard and so on and um so you need to read keep reading what people are writing now and i think that's one of the big reasons that writers who go on in other genres they don't keep reading the new stuff um but i kept reading the new stuff and i got you know I'm, the first book i the first book i bought with my own money was i think the last book that louis mcneese published i saw it reviewed in in the observer which my father took and um i thought i need this <laughs> and you you touched on that the the subject of kind of teaching poetry so you teach at kings yes so how long have you taught there only about five years and i used to do i used to be freelance for for a lot so about 30 years i was a freelance writer and so i i existed off reviewing and radio work and things like that so how do you teach poetry what is your kind of how do you what are the principles of poetry in your in your mind and how do you start off a course how do i start off a course um well i ask people why they want to write it and for in as we're on we're teaching undergraduates so um they they're doing it as a module in an english course so um I don't have very much time with them. Um, but I ask them why they want to write it. And then I get them writing a poem. Um, I structure it quite quite tightly and say, suggest what it's what should be in it. Um, and, you know, in these lines and these lines and these lines. And um, then I start to, you know, go through the principles of... Because I, I lecture as well as, as go, do the seminars. And there's a lot of stuff. It's technical stuff, you know... Um, a lot of don'ts, for instance, which Ezra Pound said at the beginning of modernism, I mean, don't, don't keep putting abstract words. One good thing, if you've got a whole lot of people for a week, is to, is to get them all sort of saying, uh, suggesting an abstract noun, and then muddle them all up and get people saying, you know, the, the um, examples of it. So surprise might be biting a chili in your porridge, something like that. And then, and then mix them all up and, and get them to take the, the examples of things out of the hat. And they realize how much more vivid the examples are, the concrete examples are, than the abstract noun. And the abstract noun is just a sort of loose, baggy thing that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, so there's sorts of things. It's, it's quite, quite technical. Can we talk a bit about how the, the poetry publishing business works, both um, when you were starting out and how it's changed now? Perhaps could you talk a bit about how you, you first went about getting published as a poet when you were starting out? Yeah, I mean, that 
that route is really the same now, even though the the organs of the methods of communication are slightly different. Um, you you start sending them to magazines. There are lots of poetry magazines, thousands. Um, and you know, I always tell people the best way is to go to a place like the wonderful poetry library in the South Bank or the Poetry Society in Ch in um, um, in Searle Street, and um, you go. You, you go and look at the magazines, see what sorts of things they have. People, every, every editor has a different taste. And then sort of see how your own poems match up and send about six to them. And then you wait and you send out others. So the good, the great sort of poetry editors, they read the magazines. They see who's coming up, who's interested. And, um, you know, the, eventually they, they keep an eye on them, on who's who's coming up who keeps sending poems and you get poems in the poetry review or the pn review or something like that what was the first poem you had published um i think it was a poem that well one oh i had one in the tls about structuralism that was a long time ago that was a sort of fun poem um but then there was then there was a poem that won a sort of minor prize in the poetry comp annual poetry competition and that was published probably at Poetry Review. And then it was published in in my first collection. It was about the earliest map. <laughs> How do you find being edited as a poet? Or did you find, because obviously it's very different from editing prose. And as you say, kind of everything has a kind of sonic quality to it. The rhythm, the rhyme. <clears throat> There's obviously so much less to work with. So every word kind of takes on greater magnitude. So how, how do you find that editing process? You mean by somebody else? Yeah. That's very complicated. Sometimes it is can be a question of taste, um, and you might not agree with your editor. Um, Do you find more so than with prose writing? Yeah. Um, I mean, most editors don't edit very much, and they vary a lot. The big poetry edit editors here, the big poetry houses, are, are um, Faber. Cape, Chateau, Picador, and then the, the dedicated poetry ones, Blood Axe and Carcanet, and then a whole host of other ones are coming up. Um, and very few of them do very hands-on editing, and they do it quite carefully. You know, they'll suggest, you know, I, mean, I remember my, for one book, I remember my editor, Parisa, saying, you know, can you find a more interesting verb than this? Something like that. Um, but on the whole, they don't, it, it's really best if, if the poet if it's a poet who's doing it. Mm. And how did you move through from publishing individual poems through to publishing collections? How does that part of the, the publishing side work? Well, you get, a, you get a group of poems together. You've had people who, who say they like your poems in poetry review or whatever it is. And then you will approach an editor. Um, and these days you'll probably be um, in a network of poets, maybe part of a workshop or something like that. And um, uh, you will... Um, you get a. You might have approached an editor. You might know who you want to send to. They might even have approached you if your po if your poems are quite striking and they've seen that your poems, and you say, "I've I've got. A, can I send a collection to you?" Or you send a collection out of the blue. Um, it's it it varies. It's a complicated um, network of different people in different places. Do you need an agent? In that? You know, most um, prose writers and novelists have said you know, it's crucial to have an agent no, to get through. No, um, because there is no money. There is no money in poetry. Um, so um, unless you, you're, you write some extraordinary poems or maybe if you go down the sort of performance route and are very popular like Kate Tempest or something, you would, that, that you know, she will get an agent. She got an agent after she won the Ted Hughes Prize. But... Um, Normally, no. I mean, I have an agent <coughs> because I also write other things. I mean, I write, you know, um, I've written novels and prose works and things like that. Um, so that's why I have an agent. You want an agent to look after the to look after the sort of, you know, the contract side of it. So, how difficult was it for you financially? Working well, with poetry and does your money still come mainly from prose rather than? Well, my mum. It's very hard to make a living as a writer anyway. I mean, if, if you're Jeffrey Arch, <laughs> you, you you do. But but um, you know, most most non most prose writers have have other jobs, teaching in universities, something like that. Um, so I was making money from reviewing. 
you know, every every hundred and fifty pounds, you know, mattered. Um, I mean, I was bringing up my daughter, and you know, I sometimes couldn't couldn't find sort of five pounds for her her pizza party or something like that. And you did a column at the Independent. I did a column at the Independent <coughs> Sunday for about sort of five years. Where yeah. you kind of did a deep dive analysis of one poem. That's right. Every yeah. Week. Yeah. Yes, I loved doing that. It was it was before it was before email. It was we had I had a fax every week. Um, to, to check out, check it out, check it was okay. How did you choose which poem to explore? Um, <clears throat> when, what nobody noticed is that I did, I alternated, strictly alternated men and women. It was extraordinary. I got so many letters and often they said it was lovely to see so many women. It wasn't, it was actually completely half and half, but it felt, uh, you know, this was in the sort of um, late 90s, it felt like so many women because people were, you know, people normally had, in listen to saw men's poems would you say <clears throat> that your work is through a feminist lens because obviously in you know you talk about the sexual experience through a woman's eyes um which is still to this day not not that common um and of course you were the first female professor of poetry at oxford i mean would you say that that it's important to you kind of writing about the female perspective and also being kind of an ambassador a female ambassador for the craft yeah I mean the the Oxford thing I was the first woman to be elected but I wasn't I didn't take up the job because there was a sort of fuss around it and I was sort of you had um, it for nine did you have it for, have nine? It for nine days yeah. yes um um but it's yes it is it is very important I don't know if you've seen my book 52 ways of looking at a poem <coughs> but in that um I talk about how women, women poets, when they started, you know, you, you get sort of eight women poets from the 17th and 18th century, a few of them. But of course, they had a model of male poetry. And that's very, I wrote a book called I'm a Man, which was about, about, um, about rock music, really. And I realized that, you know, women, women singer songwriters had to, at first, model themselves on, on what the men were doing. And then they had to break out from it. So you always have this male model to push on it. And it's a big feminist thing. I mean, the, the French feminist Hélène Sixou said it said at one point, exasperated, you wouldn't not travel on an airplane just because men invented it. Um, but, you know, you've got that aeroplane of, of the form, first of all. The sonnet, for example, it was full of men looking at women. So in my f one, the first book that, um, that was, my first book that was, yeah, that's right, that was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot was a book called Rembrandt Would Have Loved You, which actually was very much the female gaze. A, a woman, it was a series of love poems, but it was a woman looking at a man in the way that for, you know, millennia, male poets have looked through the lens of their of their sonnet at women. Um, so yes, that is important to me. When did the the money go out of the poetry business? Because if you look back at you know Byron in the early nineteenth century and things like that, these huge advances paid for paid for verse. Then when when did it stop being commercial on the publishing side? I think when other forms of popular cultural you know. Um, modes came up so for instance um i think that that french poets stopped being most french poets stopped being interesting when french cinema came up okay. or the popular song business recordings i was going to ask do you think yeah. that the, the songwriting in a sense has taken some a lot of that a lot of that film all sorts of different things of competing with poetry so it's not at all the same poets are poets the, the intensity of poetry is still there um but and people fall to it fall into it you know they write they turn the number of times that that you're asked you know to, would, could, Ruth do you know a poem because you know my mother's just died I, I need a poem for a funeral or we need a poem for a wedding um, at moments of intensity of life often only a poem will do and we touched on earlier about the rise of younger poets and Instagram poets and as you say performance poets there was that essay by Rebecca Watts the cult of the noble amateur which is all about how personality uh, poets were kind of dumbing down the form um what is your take on that yeah i haven't read all of that i mean i've read some of some of the argument um poetry is a spectrum and you can have you know a wide you know it's it's a it's a house with many many chambers and um i think you just let you know there's poetry that i'm not very interested in which i you know and there's poetry which I am interested in. And I'm interested in writing some sorts of poems um, 
and I like performing, but I don't. But often I've noticed for a long time that the poems that perform best, you know, if you have sort of two hundred people, you can you can stun them with a poem, but it's not often the best poem in the book. It's it, some poems just read better than others, and the poems that 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 are best on the page are poems which are not dependent on the personality and physical presence of the poet on the stage. And, and how much do you feel a pressure to try and get, engage that millennial audience, which, for instance, is driving poetry sales at the moment, and to try and bring that into your your core readership? Yes, I, I I want I'd like to do that simply because I mean it's nice to be read and and I think feel I have things to say, but um. Uh, I mean, I you know I lecture to eighteen-year-olds, and often I do poetry readings to them. And you know, one girl came out in tears after one, saying, "That's just that's just like me." It was it was a poem. It was a poem in my last book about my mother and about getting over the grief of my mother's death. Um, and you know, that's something which which does affect everybody whose mother has died. But a lot of millennials haven't yet had their mothers die. <laughs> Has it changed the, the kind of broader dynamics of the scene and, and you know, the industry, for want of a better word, that you said, you know, there's more focus on poetry, perhaps there's more money in the in the industry and things. Does it seem like less of a kind of cul-de-sac is perhaps the wrong word, but is it is it an area that you think in the in the broader literary firmament there is more focus on than there was ten years ago, fifteen years ago? There is, but particularly with the with the millennials that you, you mention, um and I think that Simon Armitage, now he's poet laureate, is going to try and use poetry to to focus on climate change. And um, poetry has poetry is very reactive. It takes a long time to write a novel, so there aren't very many great novels about climate change. There are a lot of very important poems that have been coming up about addressing the the sort of ecological disasters of of our time. Do you know that the, the Martin Amis short story about a world in which the experiences of poets and screenwriters are swapped over? Have you read no, this? Oh, it's, no, it's extraordinary. It's very funny. It's in I'm so sure. all of the screenwriters like live in garrets and go to readings attended by small numbers of people, and the poets have like sports cars and swimming pools. And there's it ends with a scene which is like a sort of Hollywood style development meeting for a sonnet in which like a, a cigar <laughs> like a cigar chewing executive says like you know we love the sestet. Some of us are down with the quartet, but no one likes the couplet, and they're, they're sent to do like a, a brutal rewrite. Can you, do you? I mean, do you see sort of elements of that in you know the celebrity culture around some of these young Instagram-led poets and things like that? Yeah, well, I haven't really focused on them very much. I don't find their poems as poems very interesting, um, you know. And you want to read? Why is that? Um, why? Because I don't find their language very interesting, and I don't find I find the tone of voice rather repetitive. Um, but you know, it it works for a lot of people. It, it it excites a lot of people. Do you think it is specific? Do you think really their audience are people of the same age? Do you find that in the circles that of your generation, you a lot of you hold the same views that you're not excited by that kind of? I don't. It doesn't to do with views really, it's, but it's to do with um, tone. Um, and it's to do with probably with craft. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, the, there are a lot of there are a lot of um, very wonderful, interesting poems being being written and published at the moment, which don't always get reviewed in the papers these days. They would have done ten years ago, but it's it's changed. Um, and I suppose you know, I've I've got I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in poems that that get me going, that take me to somewhere new. Um, Alice Oswald's a very good example. She's, you know, I heard I heard one of her poems on, on the radio on words and music last night. And I knew instantly it was hers. Um, you know, it's just new thought, fresh thought, in every in every relationship of every word and every sentence. Um, fresh thought, fresh depth. You know, that's what I'm interested in. Do you find it important to be able to immediately know the poet? without the name being attached, just through the tone, you, by having kind of signature authorial stamp? Um, well, no, because you, you want to have new poets coming up all the time, but new, new poets that can move the poetry, poetry forward in a way. But for instance, when, if, say, your poems were read by mm. <clears throat> people that knew your work, but your name, they couldn't see your name, would you expect for people to instantly recognise that it was a poem by you because of your personal tone um, in each 
poem that you write. I suppose some people would, but I I don't think that's it's important. important. It's not as important as good poems being written. Mm. That's what I care about. Good poems being written and new, interesting poems being written. Can we talk about verse biography, this this mm. kind of genre that you looked at with, with Darwin and then with Beethoven? Where did your interest come from that? And were there... Um, preceding examples. Didn't Betjeman wrote an autobiography in verse? Did he? Uh, I think so. Yeah, the Sound of Bells yeah. or something like that. But were, there, were you conscious that you were in a tradition no. or yourself with that? No, I, would, I felt I was inventing something because um, I mean, I, it was before the Darwin centenary and because I'm descended from him, um, various people asked me for poems. And so I did a bunch of poems for Bristol Festival of Ideas and then I did a bunch of poems for the Natural History. And I thought, well, maybe I could do a book of these. And so I mentioned it to my editor at Chateau. And she said, Ruth, that's a very good idea, but you must, we must publish it on February the 12th, which was his birthday. And this was sort of May of the year before. And it takes rather a long time to make a book, A, to write a book, and then B, to sort of process it and everything. So I had to write it very fast. Um, and I didn't really know how to get the information, because one of the big things, and you, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Byron and there's words with everybody. Um, in those days, most people who read poetry had the same sort of education. So, for instance, Tennyson knew Latin and Greek from the age of four. Um, Keats knew no Greek and little Latin. Um, but they all knew the same sort of thing. They all had the same bank of knowledge to draw on. These days, there are so many things to know in the world and there's so much, everybody's got so much different education, um, that having the information to write the poem about is a very difficult thing. You don't want to tell people things. And this is one of the things I sort of keep saying when you're, you're, um, you're teaching somebody. Um, Keats said, nobody likes a man who keeps trying to put his hand in your pocket. And p people back away from poetry that tries to tell you something. So you have, it's more, much more about revealing something. So what about the information that they have to understand they have to have in order to understand what's being revealed. That's the problem. So I didn't know how to do this. And then the um, Iraqi g guy who looked after my IT then said, um, showed me how to open a text box. And as soon as I got that, I thought, the text box, that's odd. So I, I had marginalia, which was sort of down the side of it. Um, and so you could have, so the book functions as a tiny little biography. Mm. Um, and the poems are sort of partly from his voice and partly from my meditation, snapshots of his life. With the Beethoven, it, and I thought that was, you know, I don't think anybody else had done that. And then the marginalia were slightly sort of in, in line with the Victorian you know, format and idea and setting and everything. And with the Beethoven, I didn't really want to do this. But um, I've had to because there are so, the poems go through the poems are all in my voice but the marginalia are letters and things so that the marginalia can tell the story of his life his his unhappy his his, his tragedy about going deaf at 27 um his you know his, his love affairs um his his adopting his nephew and all the rest of it and um so i wasn't conscious of a tradition i was only i think what i'm interested in is doing something new and um working with the material to see what the material will say. It's like, um, I mean, for a long time I lived with a sculptor and you know he, he worked in wood and stone a lot and it was very, very interesting to see how he worked with the material, not applying something to it, but letting it speak to him in a way. So you talk about using these poem biographies to reveal something rather than kind of chart a life. Mm. What was it, for instance, in with Darwin um, that you were trying to reveal? Was it a certain character trait that people weren't aware of or was it a, an idea that he had? What was kind of the, the crux? One of the big things about Darwin is, is um, why he took such a long time having seen, having seen the, me the mechanism of evolution and what we now call e evolution um, at, you know, before he was 30, why he didn't publish it for a long time. And um, so I wanted to get wanted to bring that out and how hard it was, how hard he worked. Um, another thing that people think about him is is that his, his wife was very, very religious and he wasn't and so on. That wasn't quite how it was. It, it was true. My grandmother, who was his granddaughter, did talk to me about that. But he, you know, he'd been training to be a priest when he was an undergraduate. So he knew all the arguments. He knew the stuff. Um, and that made him very... Um, 
very uh, canny, really, at how he phrased, eventually, how he, things he put forward. He was only interested in the science and how this could have happened. He wasn't attacking anybody. You know, it was it was his later acolytes who, who attacked people. So, so was that idea your starting point and you structured your biography around that or did that point come out, come as you were writing? It came as I was writing because, you know, I only had three months to do it. Mm. So um, I I just pitched into the autobiography to the story and went, went through the story. And what, in your view, are the determinant factors that make verse verse you know in terms of meter in terms of rhyme and things like that where do you draw the lines between prose and and free verse and and things like that how important is is, i suppose the technical craft element of verse writing to you i think a knowledge of the craft is very very useful um but it's also the sense of pressure and the sense of um, you know, you know, the white space that we have on the page is also, is also, um, it's a physical, a visual um, manifestation of the sort of pressure of concentration. Sylvia Plath said, "You have to go so far in such a short time. You have to burn away all the extremities." And I think it's that sense of concentration which is which is the first thing. Quite apart from, I mean, an ear. You have to have an ear about how how. Um, how cadences go, how words relate to each other. Um, meter is helpful, so you know how many how many beats there are in your line, how many you know what what you're doing, how the lines relate to each other. Um, I guess those are the two main things. It's interesting when I was doing my finals at, at Oxford, myself and a friend had this private competition as to who could write the most outrageous entry possible for the Lord Alfred Douglas Prize, which is a, one of the prizes at Oxford, which we thought was a bizarre thing and that the whole of the Oxford undergraduate English course had damned Bosie Douglas, sort of blackguard and a villain, and yet here was this large prize in his memory. And the poems we wrote were sort of terrible doggerel, but it, the process did, I think, in retrospect, probably teach me more about how English verse worked than three years of studying it, yeah. you know, of actually trying to, trying to write in that sense. But do you regard those rules as something to follow or something to be broken? They're tools. They're just tools. Um, part of the kit box. Um, but, you know, there's so many other things to read as well, other ways to approach it. You know, since the, since modernism, this is the beginning of, uh, you know, Ezra Pound said to get rid of the, of the pentameter, that was the first heave. So you, as a, as an English writing poet, you've always got to be aware of the pentameter and are you using it or are you, are you breaking it? And what are you doing? Um, and um, there's so many other things to do, you know, how you're using metaphor, how it goes down the page, how you, with the, the, the space between the words, the space between the thoughts, um, you know, how many S's you use in a word, how the, everything. It's, uh, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer to you, but it, um, the, more, the more craft you can know and learn, the more you can play with. Um, but, you know, nobody, you know, Beethoven was a wonderful composer, but you can't keep writing po- Beethoven. We talked about Poet Laureate, who was announced very recently, Simon Armitage. How important is Poet Laureate to you? Well, um, it, it's changed a lot in the last, and it's not unrelated to, to how important poetry was in the 19th century and how important it is now. Um, and it is becoming very much a vehicle for um, popular popular change, popular ideas. I mean, Andrew Motion did some very good work with the Poetry Archive. Carol Ann Duffy did um, fantastic work with schools and she really sort of got out there um, doing sort of poetry drives, bringing it to young people in a fantastic way. And I think <coughs> um, Simon already does that because um, he's, he's, he does a lot with schools. So I think he will be he will be very, very good in, in a new way. Um, was he who you thought would get the role? I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, but he, he's a very good choice. Could we talk about the, the Oxford thing? I'm sure you don't necessarily want to drag over this again, but what, what for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with it, what was the sequence of events that happened with your, your brief tenure as yeah. professor of poetry? Well, um, the... the um, 
one of the one of the other people up for it. There was a very good Indian poet up for it as well, Arvin Mahishtra, um, was Derek Walcott. And he'd already had two cases of sexual harassment against him, one in Boston and one in Harvard. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of graduates, particularly North American graduates at Oxford, were outraged that he was put up for this in view of that, for, put up for, for a position at a university. Um, and then some, somebody, I don't know how it happened, but the well, the first I heard of it was a Sunday Times rang me up and said, did I know that a whole lot of dossier had been sent to a lot of Oxford duns? And this was these were turned out to be pages from a book published by Chicago Press about sexual harassment on campuses. This is all American. Um, and um, but the Sunday Times thought this was, um, you know, thought it was a secret dossier. And you know, then people said I had something to do with it, and I said I hadn't. But you can you can see it's a very fervid fervid election. The, the Oxford Poetry election. Um, had you had any involvement with it? No, okay. of course not. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, that's nobody wants an anonymous thing. I and mean, it's to send things anonymously. Is, and, and also, I, you know, I, I didn't want to, I had, I had been approached by a, a journalist to ask um, about this harassment thing. And I, I, you know, I said, look, you know, yeah, there is this. And it's some, um, you don't want um, you know, I was shocked. I was shocked that, that people who were, I felt it was was disrespectful to students, to female students, American female students who had been harassed by him, and also to, to female students at Oxford. Um, so I did mention it to, uh, you know, a journalist when she asked. Um, but otherwise, I was just you know, I thought it was part of a longer conversation in which she asked me what did I want to do and some things like that. Um, so then um, when the Sunday Times broke the story, Derek Walcott withdrew. And then, you know, it just became a kind of smearing case. And I asked I asked Oxford, what do you want to do? I can, I can happily withdraw too. What would you like me to do? And they said, no, stay on, um, stay in there. So I did and I got elected. Um, but, you know, the smearing went on and I thought, I want my life back. You know, I was being doorstep by journalists and things, and I don't, I don't need this. It's only five thousand pounds a year, and I was, and I still didn't have a job. Um, so I thought, so I resigned. So you resigned after nine days. So how do you ever regret that decision? It must have been a difficult decision. What were the significance of you being the first female um, yeah. professor of poetry elected in three hundred years? I didn't, I didn't at that time have any job. It was five thousand pounds and a year, and I would have done what I wanted to do was to do a lot of things connecting, which is something what I'm that I'm doing now at um, um in in Kings is doing I'm doing something called poetry and, which is um I take I take a, I invite a poet, for instance, a cartographer or a, a geneticist. I'm um, sorry, an expert in cartography or genetics, and then I invite a poet, poet that I know is interested in it, and they're really wonderful um, discussions. We have you know, they they join in, and I, the, the idea is to connect poetry to all sorts of things within a university, um, because that's what a university is for: is bringing things together, bringing bringing poetry or astrophysics or whatever it is together. So that's what I'd wanted to do at Oxford. But I thought, I can't do this. If, if I'm going to have a whole lot of people on me all the time, and I haven't got the time to do this, how am I going to use the time to write the reviews and do the other stuff, which actually is, is what I live on? But did you feel pressure in terms, as a woman, to represent, to, to, to be the first female? At, at that point, when you're, when you're actually in that glare of publicity, you just want to get, get out, of the, out of it. It's actually, it's, it's interesting, the... Um, after I resigned, I had to do a lot because it was still the Darwin year, and I had to do a lot of um, um, readings and things. I was doing one reading for Burma um, in Westminster Abbey, and with a lot of actresses, and the actresses knew what that that pressure of publicity was like, and they were they were so nice to me. Um, um, it, it was it the Sunday Times that published. You talked about how they tactically published um, the one poem in your collection about your, was it your father's death or your 
I was can't it? remember. It was it home cooking? I can't remember. Um, oh. Yeah, probably. Which yeah. was you said was yeah. you found quite sexist because they chose the one poem that was about sex rather than from the collection that was all about death to kind of portray you in a certain way as a first female professor of poetry that you yeah. would only write kind of flimsy sex inspired work. And did you find that insulting? Or did you Well, you... I thought it was silly. You... Silly and a pity, you know. And did you expect it? Of course not. Would you expect it? Well, in that time. In that time. Well as in it's not it wouldn't be unusual to be to have that kind of sexist Yeah. yeah. But um But poets on the, the whole press. you know poets poets think about their work. Um, and they think about what they're trying to get across. They don't, on the whole, think about how people are going to misinterpret it. <laughs> Can we talk about Beethoven again yeah. in some in some more detail? So, how you obviously have a, a musical background as well. You you played and you sang. How what was the the kind of gestation of this project? Um, we should say for for readers that this is your your new book, which is yeah. out when in January twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, and it's a ver- kind of verse biography of of Beethoven. Where did this idea come from, and what was the process of? Okay, so I I've been working for quite a long time with a string quartet um, called the Endelian Quartet, wonderful quartet, um, professionals, and um, we ha- I got a sort of uh, commission to write a few poems about Beethoven between two quartets. The Opus 18s, which is his first series of quartets, and the Opus, the late quartets, which are the famous ones, and um, so that went very well, and it was enjoyable. And I, and because I'd often played quartets, I was I enjoyed working with them. So we did some more. We did we did Schubert, we did Tchaikovsky, we did in various places, um, and I suddenly thought maybe I could write. It's just like with the Darwin, maybe I could do the book, and then I and then I realised that it, next year is is the 250th anniversary. So that's where it came from. Um, but also I thought mo- I'd do it more personally. I mean, maybe I've been affected by the millennials, as you would say, that, that, you know, that I could put more of my person- personal childhood, because I've never really written poems out of my childhood. A lot of people do. Um, I read, um, you know, Seamus Heaney, for instance, you get a lot of his, his work, his, his childhood. The, the, poems, the poems and the vision really arise out of um, his his child on the f- on the farm and his sensification from within from the from within his childhood so i thought so some of my poems some of the poems in beethoven are about my childhood playing quartets and my parents meeting through playing music and so on um so it seemed natural because beethoven is so huge i mean he is one of the gods uh, you know he's such a sort of extraordinary and many-sided um artist and you know, I'm. I don't want to say that this is the Beethoven. This is a Beethoven from some one amateur musician who's grown up playing him. Um, so I thought that was that's one lens to look at him. Well, this seems like a good moment to have you, Ruth, read one of your poems from okay. from the new collection. Yeah, this is the very last poem because when he went deaf, um, he was agonised and he thought of suicide. And he decided not to. He decided to live for his art. Um, But um, he did say in his his testament in which he sort of said, this is what's happened to me and this is for the future. Um, I want you all to know that I am suffering and I am only living in order to write music for future generations. Um, Please do an autopsy to find out what the cause of this awful thing is. So they did do an autopsy. It was snowing. It was March. It was in Vienna. Um, it must have stunk, I should think. I mean, it was, you know, um, in some little room. Um, the house is torn down now. But this, I wrote this from the doctor's report. Autopsy. The auditory canal covered in glutinous scales, now exposed to the air, shining as they dry. The auditory arteries, thick and cartilaginous, as if stretched over a raven's quill. The brain, exaggerated folds, twice as deep as usual, more numerous, more spacious. The auditory nerve, withered to a pure white strand. Thank you so much. Is that is it known what the cause of his deafness was? There are books written about it. Um, 
they temporarily temporary in terms of timing um they say that he possibly had a, a fever which might have been quote typhus but that can cover a lot of things apparently medically um, which could have caused the deafness um it could have been just gluey ear. It could have been so many things. I mean, people have said he died of syphilis. People have said he died of liver disease. People have said he died of God knows what. You know, um, but and the deafness is always in there somewhere. But no, there's no, no straight answer. Super. Well, that seems a, a great place to, to wrap up the interview. So thank you for being such a, a fascinating and candid guest and wishing you all the very best with your projects going forward. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. So hello, it's us again um, with a swift update from our lives. Ellie, you've literally just stepped off a plane. Is that I right? have. Uh, I got to sleep at 3 a.m. and then actually had a strange dream where I had th- where we recorded this interview with Ruth, which is very strange. And then woke up and obviously did it. Well, this is service above and beyond. The, yeah, um, so I had a bit the, of déjà vu. The uh, the podcast requirements. Um, in terms of me, I've been in France. I was working on a magazine story, which was good. Um, but back now and, and wrapping up various other things. Um, but yeah, I think this is an interesting episode. We hadn't had a poet before, so new yeah. direction. Yeah, I, it was brilliant. And um, I thought Ruth's uh, new collection of Beethoven poems were, I mean, I haven't ever read a poem biography before. So for me, it was a an education. A new literary direction. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Eleanor Halls. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our social media is handled by Zara Hankier. Our score is by Jess Danheiser and our graphic design is by James Edgar. You can find us on Instagram at Always Take Notes or on Twitter at Take Notes Always. Uh, you could also find us on iTunes. We'd love it if you could subscribe, rate and review. Uh, and if you feel like contributing to our crowdfunding page on Patreon, that's at patreon.com slash always take notes. Many thanks. Thanks. Thanks.